morning, church. It's Thursday morning. Take your Bibles and let's go back to Isaiah. And we're going to go again to chapter number 53 as we look at this suffering servant who is to come into the world. Remember, we're talking about the king and his kingdom and how the Old Testament scriptures prophesied his coming and that he would be through Abraham and then down through David's lineage and that he'd be born of a woman, born of a virgin. And we've talked about how his kingdom is going to be established with righteousness and justice and basically reverting back to uh, where the animals are tame and don't hurt one another nor hurt human beings. And he's going to rule over that kingdom. But as we get it farther into Isaiah and the prophecies, we find out that this king that is to come is not only going to be uh, the sovereign Lord over all the earth, but he's also going to be our savior. He's going to be the suffering servant. And so in Isaiah chapter 53, we've already begun just a little bit about that. Let's go back to verse number four, and we're going to read through the remainder uh, of this uh, chapter. And notice how this just is so vivid. In fact, we get a better portrait of the crucifixion and the suffering of our Lord and Master Jesus from these verses than we do anywhere else in Scripture, even in the New Testament. Verse 4 says, Surely He has borne our griefs, He's carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Now all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. We're all sinners. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. God laid upon Jesus the sin of the world. And then verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and like a sheep before its shearers. He was silent. Now notice that. He's the Lamb of God. In fact, he was born in a sheep coat in uh, uh, what we think to be a place where sheep grew up, and that's where they would keep their sheep uh, during uh, the nights, lock them up. He was laid in a manger, and he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse number 8 says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who has declared his generation? For he was cut off, now notice this, cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Three times at least already, the prophet is declaring to us, and it's God who actually is speaking, that uh, he is going to be cut off for us. He's going to die for our transgressions. Verse 9, and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death. And so he was crucified between two thieves, but there was a rich man who gave him his, or loaned him his uh, grave because he wasn't going to need it long. Uh, just loaned him his grave for a period of time. And it says, because he has done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now notice verse, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This was God's plan all along. This was God's way, not only of glorifying His Son, but redeeming a people unto Himself. This was God's perfect plan. In fact, the Bible makes it very plain that Jesus is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That He was already, uh, in God's mind, slain. Uh, this was going to be the plan that, that God was going to allow His Son to die for the sins of the world. And this was pleasing to God. He has put him to grief when you made his soul an offering for sin. Notice that. His soul became an offering for sin. His life for my life, for your life. What a Lord. What a Savior. He shall see his seed and shall prolong his days. Now notice that. He not only does he talk about he's going to die for us and he's going to die for our sins and for our iniquities, but this, he's going to see the, his seed. He's going to see the fruit. He's going to prolong his days. In other words, he's going to come back alive. Even though this one is going to die, he's going to be alive. He's going to come back to life. 
And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his sow and be satisfied. So even though his sow has made a sacrifice for sin, he will get to see the labor of his sow. In other words, that's not the end of the story. There is a resurrection. This is a good passage for us to look to, to recognize that not only was the Messiah to die, but he was to rise again. And then verse number 13, 11 at the end of it, by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many and he shall bear their iniquities. Gosh, how many times does he have to say it? He's going to justify us as if we'd never sinned simply because he died in our place for our iniquities. Verse 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors that is he identified with us and with the thieves and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Lord we have. The King has come and His kingdom is going to be established on this earth. But first, He's going to destroy our enemy, sin and death. He's going to crush the head of the serpent and He's going to set us free from our iniquities. We need to praise Him every day. If nothing else God ever does for us, we ought to praise Him for what He's already done for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Father, our hearts are overwhelmed when we read scriptures like this, that you were pleased to allow your son to suffer and to die in our place. Help us never to take that for granted. Help us to never trample the blood of Jesus Christ under our feet. We recognize it as a precious offering. And Father, we receive Jesus as Lord and as our King. In his holy name we pray. Amen.